Hey, what's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Periodic Table. This is the show where we break down the science news of the week, and this is just one big science classroom where we learn with you, the audience. And I'm, of course, your host, Brandon Hanna. I have over nine years of experience as a mechanical engineer in the aerospace industry. And also, you might know me as a host from AfterBuzz TV, the Popcorn Talk Network, or from the movie trivia, Schmodown. And I have an amazing panel of guests for you today. You've known them, you've seen them here before, and you love them. Let's start off with another uh, member of the Schmodown community. Uh, you, you might also know her as a nuclear operations instructor, nuclear reactor operator. She's a smart cookie, and we're so happy to have her here today. It is um, the amazing Mara Kanopic. I've never heard of the movie Trivia Schmodown. I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, I must have had you confused with somebody else. <laughs> a, diff a different brown dwarf star, if you will. Probably. <laughs> uh, but we are super happy to have you here, uh, Mara. Thank so thanks you. for joining us once again. And of course, you know him. He is back. He's a TV host, actor, comedian. You might know him from After Buzz TV, Black Hollywood Live. It is James Maple. Hello, everybody in the house, party people. What's up? What's up? I'm so excited for today's episode. We are talking all things that I love, that Mara loves, Brandon loves. So I'm ready to get into it. Yes, we are talking about space. Do you need some? We might all need some. According to my mug here, I definitely need my space. <laughs> um, it is an all space themed episode today, uh, starting off with Earth is whipping around quicker than it has in half a century. What does that mean? And a mysterious wobble is moving Mars poles around. Something I think I might be familiar with here on Earth and a special segment, of course, like we have every week. This is something I thought would be fun. We're checking in with an old story. What did happen to that SpaceX Dragon capsule we talked about here a few weeks ago? We're going to find out all about its return back to Earth. But before we do that, let's jump all the way back up to the talk and let's talk about Earth. It's on the run. It's moving fast. What is going on with Earth, Earth whipping around uh, our own solar system? So what we have here, guys, and I am a little disorganized. So let me jump right back up to my notes here. Uh, according to this article, and of course, guys, uh, all the links to the articles we talk about on the show are in the description down below. Even time did not escape 2020 unscathed. Uh, so the mm -hmm. 28 fastest days on record since 1960 all occurred in 2020 with Earth completing its revolutions around its axis milliseconds quicker than average. And this is something that I find particularly interesting because um, it mentions this in the article, and this is something that I've been aware of, is that Earth's uh, rotation is actually, uh, since the late 60s, early 70s, it has been trending where Earth's rotation has actually been slowing down and days have been growing longer. So they've actually, um, every year and a half or so, have had to add uh, to our universal clocks that that we all use that all use as our basis here on Earth, they've had to add leap seconds. We're all familiar with leap years, but they've had to add leap seconds to the clocks roughly every year and a half. But this year, they're considering adding a negative leap second. Uh, so this is all pretty interesting to me. Um, Mara, you sounded super excited about these stories uh, as we were prepping for this show here today. So I want to give you the first crack at talking about Earth whipping around having negative leap seconds. What's going on here? What's your thoughts? Well, I have to say, first and foremost, I would like to thank planet Earth for making last year go by faster than ever on record in my living history. So thank you, Earth. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, but also, this is super fascinating to me because I am a huge gravitational time dilation and Doppler effect nerd. So um, I actually had a lot of fun when we watched Interstellar on Dan's Patreon and I got to explain what all of that was and no one listened and it was wonderful. <laughs> but um, like a lot of people don't realize that this is a super huge deal because satellites and things like that, there is a small like microsecond delay between their experiencing of time and our experiencing of time. So when GPS satellites and things like that communicate data to us and help us maintain our time based on the time that scientists help us establish on Earth, there's already a time correction there. So the further that we deviate from what we consider as a typical time correction can really mess up a lot of things that don't seem like they would matter, but they really, really do. So I was super into this. James, tell me your thoughts. So I'm right there with you in terms of being super into it. I have to be very honest with the entire audience. I had to read this article a couple times 
it was it's throwing out a lot of big words and like i have a pretty good understanding what was going on but one of the coolest things i thought uh was kind of the inverse of what brandon said a moment ago in that um we they are talking about leap seconds and at the end of the article they actually make note of a negative leap second because time is spinning so fat or the the um we're having to add on so many uh milliseconds to a second that it will over time it will add up now my math could be off but the way i calculated it it was 19 one thousandth of a second so in 52 years that would be roughly a full second that we would have to put on a negative leap second to compensate for that so i thought that was so cool that such a small little incremental thing could make such a big difference and really affect you know like you said a moment ago mara the satellite communications between us and and um and those orbiting us yeah, and um, and thank you, Mara, for pointing out uh, it is a good thing that Earth was able to read the room a little bit and make 2020 go by just a little quicker than what we're used to because uh, we are so happy to be here in 2021. Um, but yeah, this is super fascinating. Uh, you know, so according to the NIST, uh, which I have here in my notes, but I've lost it. So I'm going to get back to that. But leap seconds have their pros and cons. They're useful for making sure that astronomical observations are synced with clock time, uh, but they can be a hassle for some data logging applications and telecommunications infrastructure. And some scientists at the International Telecommunication Union have suggested letting the gap between astronomical and atomic time widen until a leap hour is needed uh, which would minimize uh, disruption to telecommunications and astronomers would have to make their own adjustments in the meantime. So Mara, uh, what are your thoughts on on w uh, this leap hour uh, uh, method that is being proposed uh, for keeping time? Well, not being any form of an expert on this, I've got <laughs> to say that it sounds to me like the smaller incremental adjustment seems like something that would be more preferential to me uh, in particular, especially because um, we're going to talk more about uh, science and experiments on the International Space Station later this episode. And one of the things that is important to note, because they do experience time very slightly differently than we do, is that if we aren't keeping the small incremental changes in check here, then when we are comparing the timing of experiments here versus on the International Space Station, if that correlation can't be made, you know, accurately or uh, with any scientific determination of saying, okay, well, now we can conclude this has happened in this amount of time for this reason in this place versus in that place, then it might invalidate some of the really fine granular data that needs to be generated from some of those. So I would say maybe leap seconds versus leap hours, but I don't know. I would love to be challenged. <laughs> James, James, are you here to challenge Mara? Where do you stand on the leap hour versus leap second? I am not here to challenge Mara. I am a full-time co-signer on her argument there. Um, I wholly agree. I feel like um, the, the, the measuring the incremental seconds are, I feel like it's a bit more approachable of a, of a tactic to, to really get the communication down properly. I think, I mean, for, to be very honest, I, us here in the United States have a, a difficult and I'm difficult time enough, like East Coast, West Coast time. Like that alone is a challenge for most people. So I think that, you know, a leap hour would just really throw a wrench in the system. Um, I think that the the incremental ways that we're kind of calculating it now, they, like I said a moment ago, they are far more approachable. I think that it will just facilitate a, a far greater uh, 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 level of accuracy moving forward. Yeah, I think for I'm so glad James is here because he says things that I say, but he says them better. <laughs> oh, I, oh, see, I think the opposite. That's where I disagree with you. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm just sticking my foot in my mouth. So, you know, all, all, all three of us put together, we form one cohesive thought for the audience to hopefully understand these complicated but really fascinating concepts. Um, and so speaking of which, NIST, that is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, I have a hard time reading my notes, guys, but it's fine. We're we're in this we're in this together. Um, and also, uh, so the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Services—that's a mouthful in Paris, France. Are they the ones responsible for determining whether adding or subtracting a leap second is necessary? And they say in this article that they have no plans of adding uh, any leap seconds uh, in in the foreseeable future or in the near future, I should say. But um, one thing I did. Uh, find interesting was how the the planet's rotation they say in this article it varies slightly all the time and it's driven by variations in atmospheric pressure 
uh, winds, ocean currents, and movement of the core, um, which I did not know about. You know, I watched the documentary once and they talked about Earth's uh, rotation slowing down over time. And the reasoning for that was that the moon, and I'm surprised to not see it mentioned in this article, that the moon is moving further and further away from Earth, like about four centimeters every year the earth move the moon uh moves further away from earth and that slows down the earth's rotation uh and that's what i always thought because I, the analogy that they use in this documentary that i saw i wish i could remember what it was i think it was on the science channel i used to watch a lot of the science channel guys back when i had cable i miss it uh but uh like like um like a like a like a figure skater doing a twirl how they'll like open and like close their arms to speed and slow themselves down is the similar effect of the moon slowing down the earth's rotation um mara are you familiar with uh, the the moon trying to slowly back its way out of the room until finally <laughs> earth doesn't notice that it's gone I actually didn't know specifically that it was uh, creating that additional distance, but I, like you, was wondering, especially when they mentioned ocean currents, I was like, why didn't they mention the moon at all? So I love that you kind of did some of that research for us and brought that in. Um, I also have a science fact for everyone. Did you know the moon is made of cheese? <laughs> you know, I always heard it, but I thought it was just a rumor. <sighs> Confirmed. <laughs> Twitter will put one of those little things that says mm -hmm. that that statement's disputed. Like, you know I don't care. Be careful with kicking people off Twitter nowadays. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the inter the uh, documentary you watched was the uh, the universe on on the Science Channel. Um, I think that in reading that one section we were just discussing, they were talking about um, the the core or the Earth's core and the like the uh, the tides. Um, I kind of thought that they mentioned the moon, but like inadvertently, because mm. when like it's, it's called tidal friction essentially. But when like uh, you have a planet and a moon going around the planet, because it's going around, it creates friction in the core itself of the planet. It expands and contracts and expands and contracts. So I kind of thought the same thing. I'm like, why didn't they say like point blank that the moon had some type of effect on it? But they, them mentioning the tides and the movement of Earth's core kind of made me think that the, the moon really did play a much bigger part than it said, at least in the article itself. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, tidal friction is also obviously like a big thing that that it's kind of like the that that's really like the, how the tides come in and out. It's almost like the 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 water on Earth, like kind of makes this like oblong oval type shape, which I find uh, uh, really fascinating that, um, you know, not too many people probably consider what exactly causes the tides so um did you know that well, the sun that. Mm -hmm. yeah did you know that the sun actually accounts for like a third of, of the, the tidal like friction not just mm. the moon i didn't know it was that I much did. at all i would have i'm pretty like, sure yeah. wow yeah I, I, could, agree. I, I, I could be wrong i read that somewhere once um <laughs> but you know fact check you know, me I'm on that all you <laughs> fact, -checkers fact -checker. checker he's upstairs somewhere yeah. <laughs> You know, and speaking of which, I wanted to mention, uh, in addition to the, the figure skater analogy, they also use the analogy of how cats always land on their feet is they mm -hmm. similarly bring their arms and legs or their four legs. I don't know how you want to describe it uh, in and out until they spin to just the right position and slow themselves down. And uh, and Mara, I think you you have a guest with us today on, on the I couch. Do. Over there. He's so. right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, um, that's something that's really fascinating is like cats, they will visualize. It's so crazy. It happens in like fractions of a second. They will see where they want to land. And then they do exactly what you're talking about, a la figure skating, which um, amateur figure skater over here. So I'm. Oh, oh what? what? I didn't what? even know that. <laughs> when I was younger. I had to take lessons. It was very not fun at the time. But now I realize it was actually incredibly fun. But then they will do the same thing where they've locked onto where they want to land and then they, you know, twist and turn their body and contort themselves and use their tail and help establish drag. And then they land on their feet because cats are amazing and they're way better than people. <laughs> <laughs> and they clearly have a very fundamental understanding of science and they didn't even have to read a textbook or watch a documentary or read a questionable fact about the sun on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> that we know of. Yeah, right.
<laughs> well, uh, so I just want to say we got some uh, names in the chat, some new names in the chat today. Obviously, Brandy Parker, Haskell420. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We've got Raul Mendoza uh, here. Thank you so much, Raul, for joining us today. And Jeff uh, Weisberg, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, thank you for joining us. He says, daylight savings is bad enough. No more leaps. I mm -hmm. think we're all inclined to agree on that. Um, oh, yeah. But before ben Franklin was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Ben Franklin was wrong. Let's let's get that. Um, let's uh, let's get a periodic table. Ben Franklin was wrong. T-shirt out there. Um, there and so uh, one thing the Earth does, in addition to uh, slowing down its rotation, evidently, is wobble. And it sounds like Mars is doing a very similar thing. But before we get onto that, I just want to say. Um, thank you all again, guys, for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel if you're enjoying this show and like watching us every week. Hit that not little notification bell so you don't miss out and be active in the live chat. Let us know your thoughts and comment down below. Um, if 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 you are watching maybe on replay or if you just want to help us with that uh tricky YouTube algorithm, uh comments always help the video just get a little more views. And also, I'm going to plug once again, I am working very diligently on my film physics Christmas special, guys. It is coming within the next week. Um, it is all, of course, about Die Hard. And uh, yes, Christmas is a month longer than normal. So, uh, you know, bake some cookies, drink some eggnog if you still got it, and let's still continue some holiday cheer. And the holiday season is not quite done until I say it's done. Um, <laughs> but one thing that uh, also isn't done is wobbling. There's wobbling going on all over the solar system. So we have Mars. It's wobbling. Its poles are moving around. And like I alluded to, it's actually only the second known planet to do this. I'm reading in this article, which surprised me with Earth, of course, being the first. Um, it's, called, it's a phenomenon called the Chandler Wobble. And I think there is a lot to, to unpack here about Planets wobbling. Uh, James, let's go to you. Uh, are you. Were you surprised to, to read about how Mars uh, has this Chandler wobble phenomenon the same way that Earth does? And what are maybe your thoughts on to why uh, this is happening to only two known planets mm -hmm. uh, that we know of in the whole universe? Well, to start, I thought Chandler wobble sounds like like an unreleased episode of Friends. I was just, I just <laughs> kept thinking, and I'm like, why did you choose that name? I, I know that the, the scientist, uh, Seth Carlo Chandler, God bless you for, for discovering this, but the Chandler wobble though. Um, regarding the Chandler wobble and Mars wobbling itself, um, you know, I was pretty surprised by this. I knew of it, but um, the, the kind of figure that really stood out, stood out to me uh, in reading this was the, uh, it said, what was it, four inches? Um, Mars wobbles every 200 days. And I, I thought to myself, like, that's pretty significant. And as I continue to read the article, it mentions that Earth is 30 feet um, as every 433 days. So that was like, I was genuinely perplexed as to how the Earth is wobbling uh, 30 feet and Mars only four inches. Um, another point to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying a moment ago, Brandon, uh, regarding Mars and Earth being the only two planets, I just, I find that incredibly difficult to believe. Like, incredibly, incredibly difficult to believe that Earth and Mars are the only two planets, perhaps as of now that we've discovered that, ha that you know, do this phenomena. Just, it, it's just very bizarre to me that our our neighbor is the only other rocky planet out, out there that does this thing. Um, and I have to give credit to whoever wrote this article because I think the conclusive paragraph was very funny. Um, they said, <laughs> devoid of devoid of oceans, Mars and its wobbly rotation may be governed by atmospheric pressure changes alone, according to EOS. The funny part, but further study of our tipsy neighbor is is, is required <laughs> for more. <laughs> I thought that was like a great funny way to end the article. Um, but yeah, I thought this is this is a really cool uh, phenomenon, and like I said a moment ago, I'm I'm genuinely shocked that Earth and Mars are the only two planets that we know of that you know that do this. Yeah, uh, Mara, what are your thoughts? Do you do you think that Earth and Mars are really alone in this Chandler wobbling phenomenon? Or is it maybe because obviously we notice it about ourselves because we're on this planet and we could just kind of feel ourselves doing this from time to time. And Mars is a very close neighbor. 
and maybe this phenomenon is harder to detect further away in planets in our solar system and beyond. Uh, what did you think? Well, first of all, I have to say that I think it's ridiculous that Mars took our totem because we were a wobbly top. They stole it from us. We did it first. So Christopher <laughs> Nolan, thank you for ruining tops for everyone forever. But um, no, I think I, I certainly think that just based on the generic understanding of science and the infinite nature of the universe, there is something else out there that wobbles. We just haven't detected it or don't have the ability to detect it. And long after we're dead, someone will say, oh, that thing wobbles. And then we'll say, oh, well, you know, Mara and, and uh, Brandon and James were right. So um, I just was really surprised to know that it was such, I actually think that the disparity on Mars, it's wobble was, it sounded really big to me. So I was really surprised. I expected it to be much, much smaller and over a much longer period of time. Like that seems like kind of a big wobble for Mars. That's just me though. Yeah, this, um, this whole wobbling thing has really got my head spinning, but uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> um, but one thing that I did find particularly interesting is that in the article it says scientists have calculated that the wobble should naturally die down within a century of its origin, but our planet's current wobble has been going strong for much longer than that, and uh, I guess they attribute it to uh, perhaps a combination of pressure pressure changes in the atmosphere and oceans. Um, that was according to one uh, 2001 study that seems to be perpetually reigniting the wobble, um, and uh, though the exact mechanism is still unknown. So this kind of ties into our like number one story of today. Uh, the pressure changes in the atmosphere and the oceans uh, causing this wobble, also causing the Earth to slow down uh its rotation are these two phenomenons connected in some way what do we think james uh i'm gonna say i'm my my initial reaction is to say yes um it's again to kind of go back to the whole to the the moon instance and that having to affects the, the ocean currents here and they mention it in the second article as well i just found it i just found it very difficult to believe that these two things aren't interconnected in some way so I would have to say, with my basic understanding of what we're talking about, I'd say yes. I agree. I mean, I certainly think that there's a correlation, although I don't necessarily think that there's a causal relationship between the two. I think it it's stemming from the same incident uh, or mechanism is probably true. I also think, though, that it's interesting that stuff like this, because we're going to talk about again just in a few minutes, the the idea that scientists are doing experiments all the time on Earth and in space and trying to discover the mysteries of everything that we can think of. But there's no way to replicate this. This is all computer modeling or just theories and, and mathematics and just people with bigger brains than all of us combined sitting in a room and figuring things out. And the idea that it's we could never replicate this ever because we would never be able to doc, like to duplicate the exact circumstances of where we are positioned in the universe and the effects of gravity and every other small variable that we can't even consider. So I think it's fascinating that as much as we might come to an answer, whether or not it's the answer or the most correct answer is always going to be somewhat of a mystery. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. This is something that is super complicated. There are so many variables that contribute to the wobble of the Earth, the slowing of the rotation, the speeding up of the rotation in 2020. I always think, like I said, I think that's just Earth throwing us a bone uh, there a <laughs> bit. But uh, yeah, and what I find really uh, interesting in particular about all this is that scientists, you know, they theorize, they hypothesize that the wobble should be slowing down uh, but the wobble is just, it's, it's just keeping on wobbling. It's just keeping <laughs> on doing its thing. And they're a little perplexed by it. And I think that's just kind of the beauty of science. And, and like, and like you said, Mara, um, our, our special segment is all about scientific experiments that have to do with space, help us maybe get a better understanding of the earth's wobble in some cases or Mars's wobble now, which I kind of like that both earth and Mars are just kind of like hanging out right next to each other, by the way. And we're, we're just both kind of doing this. Just doing our thing. Yeah. Just doing you, our thing. If you guys, have you guys ever been to uh, the Griffith, Griffith observatory? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So this is a great way for our audience out there to really understand the wobble. As soon as you enter the Griffith Observatory here in Los Angeles, there's a Falcult uh, pendulum. And essentially the pendulum stays still and you can see it like knock down pens, but it's the, the, it looks like the pendulum is moving, but it's not. We're moving on Earth. So um, for those who like really want to kind of de delve deeper into understanding on a more practical level, that's a great way to um, kind of understand a bit more of what we're talking about. That's a great point, James. Yeah, definitely, guys. I know uh, um, I think it's still closed down right now due to the pandemic. Oh, yeah. But when keep forgetting uh, about that, <laughs> <laughs> that tricky pandemic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but when things go back to, to being a little more normal, a little safer, and they do reopen, you know, Griffith Observatories, other planetariums and, and science museums around the country uh, and the world, we highly encourage you all to go to go explore and uh, and share your experiences of what you learned uh, here every week uh, on the show. So let's get into our special segment, guys. This is checking in, checking in with an old story. So on December 5th, we covered a story about SpaceX sending loads of science to the International Space Station aboard its Dragon spacecraft. And while that Dragon capsule is returning to Earth, it is uh, planning on making a splashdown, if you will, of science on January 11th, um, it says here in the article, the SpaceX Cargo Dragon spacecraft carrying the company's 21st commercial supply services uh, mission for NASA. It undocks from the International Space Station, and it's going to land off the coast of Florida about 12 hours later. And like we talked about on December 5th, this uh, Dragon spacecraft, it had a lot of fun and exciting science experiments. Um, and what I find particularly neat about all this stuff is that they say in the article, and this is directly from NASA, that science returns from the space station through NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle. So since the space shuttle program, this is the first time that science experiments are coming back to the Kennedy Space Center, which I think is absolutely crazy because how long has it been? I don't, I don't know the exact year uh, off the top of my head that the space shuttle program was uh, put to an end, but it's been quite some time. Mara, let's go to you first. Uh, I know you sounded really excited about uh, these experiments coming back to Earth and science coming back from the International Space Station uh, for the first time in quite some time. Yes. I mean, I was very interested. I love seeing and hearing about everything that's going on in space because I think there's perhaps maybe I'm just generalizing, which isn't always the right thing to do, but just a person that isn't super interested in space or in science or just isn't as plugged into current events probably don't know what astronauts really do when they're up there. And a lot of what they do is science experiments for people on Earth. And the one that really fascinated me the most, because I wasn't aware of, of anything like this, was um, the idea that they're looking at how uh, changes and microgravity can be used for regenerative medicine, which I think is super interesting because it's not something that I would have immediately considered, you know, a lot of times when you think about uh, treatments and stuff, you think, you think of pharmaceuticals and things like that. You don't always think about the environment in which you're treating something and how that can affect uh, regenesis in this specific incident incidents. But it's like, what if we could just take people up into upper atmosphere and treat them for certain health issues? And that can be something that can make a dramatic difference. And it doesn't have to be something that's necessarily pharmacological or surgical. And, you know, anything minimally invasive, like changing the environment in which you're treated is something that could be just a monumental discovery. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, we can get to a point where it is going into space is more accessible. And if there's a way to to treat people in space for certain, uh, you know, cardiovascular problems or what have you, um, that's something that can be explored. Who knows? Maybe we even just have a hospital just that just hangs out in like low Earth orbit. I think yeah, that would I mean, be something really cool. I kind of equate it to like hyperbaric treatment, you know, here on earth right now, because it's something that's fairly easy to uh, understand and attain as long as there's a facility that offers it. And it can rapidly help with healing and stuff like that. And all it is, is it's just putting you in a different environment than what you were in when you weren't inside of a hyperbaric chamber. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really neat. 
Yeah, definitely. James, what about you? Are you excited about any of these experiments in particular that are making their way back to Earth uh, or just overall uh, thoughts um, of the excitement of science coming back from the International Space Station? Of course, I'm brimming with excitement for this. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm happy that we, we are kind of following up on this story because, you know, we did talk about it, uh, you know, a couple months ago or whenever it was. Um, I guess of all the, the citations that it noted in the article itself, I had to say the Roten research was the one that was most interesting to me. They were studying, they were studying I think they said they were studying the cardiovascular system of, of rodents and uh, their arteries and veins as they are um, transitioning back from outer um the outer limits of space into into our atmosphere. Um, one thing, though, that I noted in reading this article that we kind of joked about on the last time talking about it, they do you remember they mentioned they were going to send up a, a COVID nineteen experiment? I was very as I was reading this, um, I was really hoping to get some kind of like information of like you know, okay, well, did we did we find, did you find anything? Can you tell us? Um, and I actually googled COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, SpaceX, Fal uh, what was it? SpaceX Dragon capsule. And the only thing I could find was predictions that uh, Elon Musk had COVID, you know, a month ago when the <laughs> that's the only thing I can find. So I I'm really, I do want to follow up with, with, um, with that aspect of the previous article that we saw. Cause that was a really, cause we kind of joked about it, like COVID in space, but I do want to know like what happened with, with, with the COVID experiment that they had in space. Um, and then lastly, I thought it was pretty interesting too in the article that they mentioned that they would have to have two different uh, fleets to go retrieve everything from the capsule itself. I hadn't really thought about, you know, the time sensitivity of certain uh, experiments that they had transitioning into our, back into our atmosphere. So I thought that was a pretty interesting thing to note that there had to be two different fleets come and get the good stuff as soon as possible, let the other stuff stay and we'll come back and get it in a moment. So I thought it was pretty interesting uh, my, my major takeaway from the article itself. Yeah, it says here was just within just a few hours of splashdown, they're getting these science experiments, you know, to, to shore like via helicopter, via boat, whatever they got to do. Um, but yeah, you make a good point. Um, there is some experiments that I noticed that they, they, cause they say like, Oh, some of the experiments coming back ex uh, include, and they've gone into detail in the article. Um, some of these, uh, I, I don't remember seeing in the original article. And then, like you said, some of them, like the, the COVID experiments were in the original article and not mentioned here. So that does make me wonder, maybe those experiments might still be ongoing. Maybe they just haven't, you know, mentioned them in, in the article. Uh, maybe some of the results were a little more inconclusive than others. So maybe they just kind of like sweeping it under the rug. I don't really, <laughs> I don't want to accuse NASA of everything. I love them. They need their space. I need yes. mine. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, I just think, I think dude, it is interesting. Um, it just, you know, it poses questions, which is what science is all about. Like, oh, maybe, maybe they're still working on these experiments. Uh, we, we can, we can only hope um, and, and, yeah. and speak. Yeah. The oh, alien nature of space mm -hmm. posed one really interesting thought to me uh, when we were getting ready for this episode is that, you know, it's really such a shame that folks on the International Space Station can't be watching us live right now because <laughs> in space, no one can hear you stream. <laughs> that's <my> oh. <laughs> That's, that's pretty good. I was wondering where that was going. I, know, I really stretched that out a bit. Um, <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a great build up. Great build up. Oh, great build thank up. you. Yes. I'm an amateur. All, <laughs> although all jokes aside, you know, with what you were saying uh, in our initial article about the time of like satellites in space syncing up with Earth in the International Space Station, they might be, you know, a second off of where we are here on Earth. So they might not be able to actually see us live. They that they might have a delay themselves if they even tried. I mean, it, it takes eight minutes from sun from from light to get from the sun to Earth. So I feel like it's, you know sh some stuff could go down. So you know <laughs> that the little time difference could really make a make make a major difference. If you know what I mean. These yeah. are the conclusions that people come here for, and I think that we've really <laughs> delivered today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, you know, it's important. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of, a little bit of humor, a little bit of uh, facts, a little bit of Brandon just throwing stuff out there, not knowing what he's talking about. Uh, but speaking of which, we did have Brandy Parker uh, say in the live chat uh, about uh, 20 minutes ago. I missed this uh, when you mentioned it, Brandy. But according to Georgia State University, the Sun's actual title 
influence is 44% of that of the moon. So I initially thought it was 30, but it's actually more, wow. 14% more, 44%. So that that's quite a bit. Um, so just, you know, shout out to the moon and the sun, you know, because we need the tides just the way they are right now. And Brandy uh, for bringing that fact to our attention. Yes. Yes. Thank and, you, Brandy. And th thank you, Brandy. <laughs> So there you go. Like I said, this is a show where we learn along with the audience, but sometimes the audience teaches us a thing or two along the way. So guys, please feel free to get involved. You know, if you feel ambitious enough to go out there and do your own research and say, no, Brandon, you're wrong. I'm going to love that. Like that is exactly what we're here to do. Like be polite about it, obviously. You know, don't hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm a sensitive boy, but you know. Like, let's have that discussion. Let's have that conversation. That's what science is all about. Um, and speaking of, of science, there were a few more experiments mentioned uh, in this article that have made their way back. Uh, a Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency study. Ooh, and this is going to be very difficult to pronounce, but I'm going to try space organogenesis, uh, which demonstrates the growth of 3D organ buds from human stem cells in order to analyze changes in gene expression, that's a lot to soak in. Um, <laughs> result from this investigation could show advantages of using microgravity for cutting edge developments in regenerative medicine um, and may contribute to the establishment of technologies needed to create artificial organs, uh, which is something that I find super fascinating. You know, um, I had a very close family friend who who needed a kidney transplant and and luckily um his, his sister was a donor uh, she was she was a match for him and she she was able to donate and both of them are now super happy and healthy and that's great but imagine if you need a kidney they can just grow a brand new kidney for you that is genetically identical to the one that you already have but just obviously a healthier uh version um and you can do this with with you know uh, I don't know, heart transplants, who knows how far this can go. Uh, so that's something that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, and then we also have something called the bacterial adhesion and corrosion experiment, which identifies the bacterial genes used during biofilm growth, examines whether these biofilms can corrode stainless steel and evaluates the effect effectiveness of a silver-based disinfectant. The investigation could provide insight into better ways to control and remove resistant biofilms contributing to the success of future long duration space flights. So I don't even know exactly what all that means, <laughs> but the last sentence, you know, contributing to the success of future long duration space flights. I think that is particularly interesting to me. This is telling uh, me that they're looking into this sort of thing for sending astronauts to Mars and even further beyond where uh, people are going to be at space for, for months at a time. And right now there's so many unknown variables. It's very unsafe. Um, think about you know, Matt Damon in The Martian, but way worse. So, you know, um, do, do uh, James Mara, do either of you have any thoughts on, uh, I'm just kind of like throwing this out there now, uh, sending p humans to Mars because this is, uh, you know, all this stuff is kind of tied together. We talked about Mars earlier. Um, do you think this is something um, worth pursuing? Do you think that this is something that um, we will be able to achieve in the not too distant future? Um, James, let's start off with you. What are your thoughts on sending people to Mars? Let's throw that out there. You know, I think that we've made so many advances in in, in, in the past six months even, you know, even talking about... Uh, uh, almost vacational space travel. The fact that we're even discussing these things is is definitely the, st the, the steps we need to be taking for something like, well, what, what is it? Uh, for, for something like colonizing, colonizing Mars, something like that. So I, I wholly support this. I think that, that you mentioned a moment ago, it is it will be a, 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 a human achievement to do something like this. Um, and I think that Given the current circumstances that we have on on planet Earth and the trajectory that the the way that we're going now, I think we can liken back to maybe a couple episodes ago where we we're talking about the effects of climate change. So I, I think that it's going to come to a point where we really may not have a choice but to go to Mars and or or try to colonize another planet. So I think that these are the fact that we're discussing these things and we're we're, we're making the steps 
and we're taking the steps to um, to check, you know, cardiovascular systems of, of mice and and grow organs in space and potential COVID nineteen in space. I think that these are all positive steps to to um, increase the longevity of, of of man. So I wholly support traveling to Mars, and I understand it's like a, a eight or nine month journey just to get there, and um, I can only hope that we're alive to see something like that happen. Yeah, what about you, Mara? What are your thoughts? Um, is Matt Damon worth rescuing from Mars? Is it worth the government funding to constantly rescue Matt Damon from space? That's a that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to table that for our for the next time we talk about space because I could talk about <laughs> that at length. But um, I, I agree completely with James, and I think that even if let's just say that we sent. Uh, personnel to Mars and we examined it and we experimented and maybe we tried doing something like terraforming, et cetera, just taking steps and investigating and looking at what's there. Even if we find nothing, like we end up with no answer, that in and of itself is an answer and it allows us to then focus on something else and then focus on something else. So, I mean, the search for knowledge, even when you don't find what you were looking for, it's still knowledge. So I... I know that if I didn't have a Dan Merle uh, or these two lovely fur children, um, I would 100% go to Mars. Send I would I would say send me to Mars because I I have a perverse fascination with going to space. Like I'm I promise you, if commercial space flight happens, this person is going to take their 401k and is going to get a ticket because I need to experience <laughs> actual weightlessness, not like simulated weightlessness. And I have to know what it's like to pee in space. Like I have to know these things. So um yeah, I would totally go to Mars, by the way, just so we know. And you wouldn't have to rescue me. I would just stay there and eat potatoes forever. Perfect. Yeah. And, I, and me personally, I'm all for uh, traveling to Mars. I hope it's something that we get to see in the not too distant future. I know NASA and SpaceX are all kind of working on this together and they've, you know, uh, broken a lot of new ground, made a lot of steps, you know, with um, the, the Falcon rocket and all that and all that uh, new technology that, that they've been developing. And of course, um, sending, you know, this was uh this dragon capsule was sent to the international space station with supplies and science experiments but they're also sending astronauts there from american soil for the first time in a long time as well so uh we're all definitely making the correct steps uh towards there so i'm excited to see how that all uh progresses and and last but not least there was uh an experiment here about fiber optic production making optical fibers in microgravity using a blend of zirconium barium Lanthanum. Lanthanum. The show's called The Periodic Table. I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> it. Uh, sodium and aluminum. Got those two, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, an experiment about uh, creating these fibers in space, and they actually end up having superior qualities to the ones created on Earth. So I don't know what this means for our internet connection, Mara. This was something we were talking about before we yeah. went live about fiber optic internet. I don't know. And, 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 and James, I believe you were on the show when we talked about the quantum internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't know how all this ties in together, but I'm just looking forward to hopefully stronger internet connections where we can do this show seamlessly and nothing cuts out like last week. Well, <laughs> you can kind of think about it like this. It's not a direct comparison, but it at least kind of helps a bit. Think about um, for people that like to cook, if you're cooking something that requires a really low humidity level. So like in LA, I never had trouble cooking anything that like macarons or um, like if you were doing a peanut brittle or something, the humidity level vastly influences the quality of your product. So me cooking something in Arkansas, if I didn't have the same relative humidity level, I would end up with a vastly inferior product. So that could be a way that, you know, maybe some of our audience could take a look at why would building something somewhere else really have that big of a difference? So that could be just a way to make it a little bit of an easier comparison. And I can I can actually pick it back on that. Uh, I am a massive space nerd, but I also am a massive plant nerd, as you can see behind me as well. So Mara raises a great point. Uh, I mentioned this last week when I was kind of showing my little plant baby before. You can grow a plant um, in a completely different humidity and every other variable will be the same. And the plant in higher humidity, if it's like a tropical loving plant, it will be a superior, more robust plant itself. So just the sheer changing of environment can really make a difference depending on the variable that you're using. We have to totally talk botany at some point. because yeah, Absolutely. I, 
I love plants. Plants don't love me. So you need to teach me. Absolutely. I got you, girl. I got you. <laughs> there you go, guys. We are starting a botany club. Uh, I'm going to fill this whole apartment with plants. Uh, it's going to be I'll like poison, poison ivy. ivy's layer in here. Yes. <laughs> you could be my bane. There you go. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, 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 no Batman and Robin references, please. Um, but before we get going, uh, we also do have BCD uh joined us in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. Uh BCD, um uh Jeff uh, Weisberg said organogenesis sounds like a Star Trek science. So I just had to bring attention to that because I do love me some Star Trek. Um and Brandy Parker also says that she would go to Mars in a heartbeat. So, all right, Brandy. Let's like do it. All of our I, earthly attachments will go to Mars. I'm in. <laughs> and she also says that she kills all the plants. I need to get better at that. So two <laughs> things that Brandy and Mara appear to have in common. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, guys, for, for joining us this week. I think this just about wraps up our show. Uh, it was a space-filled show. Uh, it was full of facts and knowledge and quirkiness and fact corrections. Thank you, Brandy, for that. Um, so uh, thank you once again, guys. Uh, Mara, if the good people watching want to be able to find you online, ask you questions about science, uh, talk to you about uh, your shared love for killing all the plants, uh, where can they, where can they uh, do that? You can find me on Twitter at that Mara. Um, anybody that knows how to use Instagram and can teach me, please let me know because I have an Instagram. It's at that Mara L A because someone else there is that Mara already, but I don't know how to use Instagram. So help me. Um, I'm also going to abuse Brandon's platform for a minute. And it's actually very, um, I'll use the word that I used in our pre-show again, serendipitous that um, Brandon shared um, about his close family member um, requiring organ donation. And I was just hoping that people would consider that even though we are out of the season of giving, to uh, consider doing something even as simple as a blood donation if you're healthy and you're capable and uh, discuss it with your doctor first, of course, but consider uh, giving the gift of meaningful life by becoming an organ donor or by joining the bone marrow registry at be the match.org. There's an FAQ there. It talks about, it dispels a lot of rumors that Hollywood has generated about the painfulness of organ of um, bone marrow donation, et cetera, and the recovery. So um, please just look into it and consider it because it can really, really change somebody's life. Yes, definitely, guys. Uh, go check all that out. Um, I'm, I myself, I used to donate a lot of blood. I haven't done it uh, in the past uh, year or so. So that's something that I personally can try to get back in the habit of doing, you know, every, every few months that I'm uh, physically allowed to, to donate as much as they'll let me. I think I, they only take a point. I think I could donate to and be okay. I think I could push the limit. <laughs> I just got to talk to some people. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I'll definitely also look into the, the bone marrow uh, thing as well. And uh, I, I am an organ donor, guys. I also encourage uh, you all to, to do that as well. Because um, I, I think uh, Mara made some really, really great points. And thank you for, for, for using this platform to, to share all that. I think that was great. Um, James, if the people... Are, are all they're all talking to Mara. They're all killing plants together. They really need your help. They want to they want to yeah. save their plants and they want to reach out. They say, James, we need your help to save these plants. Where can they find you? <laughs> uh, so reach out to me. You can find me on uh, Twitter below at James Maple Actor. I am on and probably more actively on Instagram. So Mara can help you out with the Instagram um, help if you need. Um, I'm th over there. I'm at Terrell James Maple, E R R E L L James Maple. Um, and I guess my closing message would be, uh, you know, what's what's free kindness. So be kind to each other, and also wear a mask. That would be my closing argument. Awesome. Well put. And we do have, I just want to shout out BCD in the ch chat saying, as someone who has been a bone marrow receiver, I strongly recommend listening to Brandon and Mara about bone marrow organ donation. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us, BCD. Um, uh, yeah, like I think I, it was just really well said, uh, Mara. So thank you for, for sharing that once again. And just super shout out in the last minute, we have Miss Movies saying killing plants is my specialty. So thank you for joining us, Miss Movies. And Jake Yacoveta as well saying, I've got to watch the replay of this, but looking forward to it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone at home for joining us. We will see you again next week. And as always, thank you, Tom.